was 100 years ago today that the Civil War came to an end at 3.45 p.m. at Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia. On that Palm Sunday afternoon, General Robert E. Lee surrendered his army to General Ulysses S. Grant. The two great generals seemed to epitomize the contrasting societies they represented. Lee, tall and handsome, dressed in his finest uniform, complete with sword, was a living manifestation of the Old South. General Grant was only 43 years of age. He appeared in a rumpled uniform with mud-spattered boots. He was a self-made individualist who represented the new and emerging America. This was the America searching for new lands and broader horizons, a society unconcerned with class distinctions. The terms of the surrender was one of the most generous in the history of modern warfare. Lee's army was not to be taken prisoner, but paroled and allowed to return to their homes. Eyeing Lee's handsome sword, Grant decided it would be unnecessary humiliation to require that it be surrendered. Grant allowed the Confederate soldiers to keep their own horses, mules, personal baggage, and sidearms. As a final act of generosity, Grant ordered 25,000 rations sent over to Lee's starving army. Grant forbade any firing of guns in celebration. He considered the Southerners no longer the enemy, but fellow countrymen. Today, as the nation faces another great crisis, it is well to remember the friendship and courtesy between Lee and Grant. The present crisis is not a Southern problem. It is an American problem. The problem exists in almost every city and community in the United States, and the entire world is watching to see if the American dream will work. In a time of crisis such as we're facing, will democracy really work? During the darkest days of the Civil War, somebody asked Abraham Lincoln if he did not think God was on his side. He said, I'm not concerned as to whether God is on our side, but I am concerned as to whether we are on God's side. On this Palm Sunday, it would be well for the American people to pause and remember that our benefits as a nation have come from the hand of God. Let us repent of our sin and turn by faith to the God of our fathers that he might help us in the present crisis. As one crisis follows another throughout the world, the New Testament's message of hope is more needed by a confused and alarmed people than ever before. Never has the cross of Jesus Christ towered so in judgment over the events of time as today we begin Holy Week. As we begin this Holy Week in the church's calendar, it would be well for us to go back 2,000 years ago and listen to the Apostle Paul who said, For I am determined to know nothing among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The Apostle Paul preached and proclaimed throughout the early Roman world that there was no hope for the world, no hope for the individual, except the cross of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul had learned that there was no possibility of solving the problems of the world apart from the cross. The late German theologian Karl Heim once said that the answer to the world's dilemma is the kerygma or the proclamation of the gospel and that the heart of the kerygma is the cross. Yet the Apostle Paul referred to the cross as a scandal to the world. He asked the churches of Galatia why it was that if he preached works he would not be persecuted. But the moment he started preaching the cross, that's when they began to persecute him. If that were true, he said, then the scandal of the cross would cease if he preached only works. To the Corinthians, he once said that the preaching of the cross was foolishness to the intellectuals of that day. And the word that was translated foolishness could have been translated idiocy or moronic. That expression, the offense of the cross, at first may sound strange to the modern world. We have crosses on our churches, embossed on our Bibles, and worn as pendants from our necks. The cross is an emblem of art to the poets. There may be nothing wrong with this sentimentality, but the Bible teaches that the cross, as understood in the New Testament days, was an offense, a stumbling block, a scandal, idiocy, moronic to that world and to every world that has ever been since then. Christ is not always attractive to the human heart, no matter how he's presented. Isaiah says with prophetic vision as he looks down the corridors of time, there is no beauty in him that we should desire him. Paul, living after Christ, found the cross, provoked the scorn, and aroused the antagonism of men. 
when he held up Jesus Christ and him crucified, many were offended and turned away in contempt and rage. Today, we hear the cry from all over the world. Back to Christ. I want to ask, what Christ are we going back to? The president of one of our theological seminaries remarked, I'm convinced we're having a religious revival in America, but he said, it is not the Christian religion. Sometimes when we look at Christ, we get a wrong concept of him. Too often he is only the Jesus who walked in Galilee or an ideal created by a picturesque imagination. He is not the Christ of the cross. The cross in the days of Christ stood for a place of horrible execution. It was reserved by law for murderers, inciters of rebellion and the lowest kind of criminals. The cross meant tragic suffering and slow death for the victim was exposed to the elements and to the animals that prowled at night. There was no suffering comparable to the intense physical suffering of a man being executed. When Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you have to take up a cross, it was the same as saying today, come and bring your electric chair with you. Take up the gas chamber and follow me. He did not have a beautiful gold cross in mind or the cross on a church steeple or on the front of your Bibles. Jesus had in mind a place of execution. Paul found that wherever he went, he had no difficulty until he began to preach the cross. Wherever he went, he found that the cross was an offense. It was a scandal. People did not want to talk about it. They did not want to hear about it. And after 2,000 years, it has not changed. In America, Europe, Asia, and Africa, the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ is still a stumbling block to men who want to go to heaven but are not willing to pay the price of the cross. There are four reasons, among others, why the cross is moronic and idiocy and foolishness and an offense to modern man. First, the cross is idiocy to the present world because it condemns the sins of the world. The thief on the cross looked at Christ dying, confessed openly his sins and said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. The fact that Christ was dying and his blood was being shed had thrown the searchlight on his own wickedness. He saw the purity, holiness and righteousness of Christ dying not for his own sins but for the sins of the whole world. And he recognized immediately that in comparison to Christ, he was a sinner and he cried out to Christ for salvation. That is how I know I am a sinner, not only because I've broken the Ten Commandments, but because I've come short of the glory of God. The glory of God is Christ, and if I fail to live like Jesus, to be as holy, good, pure, and righteous as Jesus was, I come short. I'm a sinner. Who of you can stand up and say, I'm as good as Jesus? None of you can. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. Look at Herod. He was the king of Galilee. He was living in adultery, committing the sin that broke the seventh commandment. And the Bible teaches you can commit adultery many ways. Jesus said, if you look upon a woman to lust after her, you've committed it already. A word, the dirty joke, the obscene language, the pornographic literature that plays upon the imagination, it is the same in the sight of God as if you had committed the act itself. Herod condemned Christ because his purity, love, and graciousness shone upon Herod's sin of adultery. Herod did not like it, and the cross became an offense to Herod. Neither do you like the cross, maybe because of your immoral, sensual sins. Look at Caiaphas, the high priest, filled with pride, cold and crafty. He faced Christ, and the shadow of the cross pointed as a dagger at the heart of Caiaphas. He saw his own selfishness but he could not stand it. And the cross became an offense and a scandal to him. And to all of you filled with your own ego and pride, the cross will be the same. Pride was the sin of Lucifer, and it is the sin of the world today. We feel that we can please God by our own works and somehow get to heaven by our own religious effort, and we don't need to come by the way of the cross. But the Bible says, by grace are ye saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. We don't like that. It offends us. This is the scandal of the cross. We have developed rockets and think we can do anything. We don't like to be told in our day that we must become little children to enter the kingdom of heaven. But I tell you, salvation is of God. It is God who took the initiative. God who gives repentance. God who plants the seed of faith in the heart. God who regenerates the heart. Look at Pontius Pilate. His sin was fear. He was a moral coward. 
How many people would give their lives to Christ, but they're afraid of what the crowd of the neighbors will say? They're afraid to face their family. They don't want to be called a square. Or look at Judas. The cross shone in the direction of Judas, filled with covetousness, greed, and ambition. He wilted and became a suicide because the cross was a stumbling block. Judas could follow Christ when the people were cheering. Judas was right there in the parade on Palm Sunday when the band was playing and everything was going fine and the people were shouting and cheering. But when the chips were down and Jesus began to talk about a cross, Judas said, count me out. He was putting his money and his own ambition before God as many of you are. Has money come between you and God? A few months ago, a man accepted Christ in one of our crusades and said to me, from now on, although my business may go broke, I shall make only honest dollars. And that's exactly what happened. He did go broke. But he has in his heart Jesus Christ, and he's now being successful in business once again. Look at the Apostle Paul. Wherever he went to preach, the cross was an offense. He preached before Felix, and the burning message of the cross condemned Felix so that he trembled. But he said, when I have a more convenient season, I'll call for you, Paul. Go away. There never came a more convenient season for Felix. That was his last hour, and he did not know it. A man in the gallery one night during one of our recent crusades trembled. He gripped the seat until his fingers throbbed with blood. He went home and dropped dead that night. Paul preached the cross to Festus, who cried out, Paul, you're mad. You're a raving maniac. The cross was a scandal. It was idiotic. It was moronic to Festus. And Festus, as far as we know, died without God and without Christ. The scripture says men love darkness because their deeds are evil. The cross throws spiritual light into the dark recesses of our soul and shows us our sins. The cross becomes an offense because it condemns us as sinners. Secondly, the cross is idiocy to this present world because blood was shed there. People say this is a slaughterhouse religion, a repulsive religion of blood. From Genesis to Malachi in the Old Testament, you will read of the blood. It is repulsive to some, but God put it there. Blood means life. The life of the flesh is in the blood. When blood is shed, life goes. Jesus gave his life on the cross when he shed his life's blood, and there's no way of salvation or forgiveness or redemption apart from the blood of Jesus Christ. Thirdly, the cross of Christ is idiocy because it puts forth an imperative ideal of life. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We're busy in our churches today building new buildings and sending in reports and all the rest of it. But Jesus demands that we live the life every day that we walk in fellowship with him, that we love our neighbors ourselves. And we don't want to do that. We want to live our own lives. We want to do it the way we want to do it. We reject the call of Christ from the cross. And fourthly, the cross of Christ is idiocy because it claims to be the only way of salvation. It demands from every man as his first duty that he get right with God. We do not like that. We like to think that there are other roads to heaven besides the one road. Jesus said that the gate to heaven is narrow. At the beginning of that gate is a cross. And no man will ever enter the kingdom of heaven unless he comes by the way of the cross. There are no other ways to heaven except by the way of the cross. I tell you today, as a minister of the gospel of Christ, that there's no other way to be saved except that way. Have you been saved? Have you trusted in Christ? You can find a new life here and now. Your future can be assured. Your sins forgiven. You can become a partaker of God's life. Jesus finished his work on the cross. It's all finished. All you have to do is receive it. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we pray that many this day will come to the foot of the cross on this Palm Sunday or during this Holy Week and find forgiveness of sin and new life. For we ask it in his name. Amen.